This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. So get ready to rock. It's kind of like a service industry job rather than like being an artist. Our job as composing is making the director and the filmmakers and the, you know, eventually the studio happy. You'll be going back to the drawing board a lot, or at least you have to be willing to do that, you know. So that's something I learned, and I'm glad I learned quite early on, was you can't let yourself get crushed every time someone says, oh, that's not right, or that's not working for me, or, you know, that's not the right vibe. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. The Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. In the studio, this means that critical details from your microphone get through to your DAW. The 101 was used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon. Today, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the STX100 mic pre. Learn more at Spectra 1964. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rock Stars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jason Suda, a composer, singer, songwriter, producer, mix engineer from the UK. He's been based in Los Angeles since 2009 when he was invited to intern at Hans Zimmer's studio complex. Jason was quickly recruited by composer Matthew Margeson um, of The Rocket Man, Kingsman, The Secret Service, and The Golden Circle, and Rings, among many others, and they have been collaborating ever since. In this additional music capacity, Jason has also worked with composers Henry Jackman, Dominic Lewis, Haytor Pereira, Jim Dooley, Al Clay, Daniel Heath, Benjamin Walfish, and Ryan Tobert, among many others. And as a composer, Jason recently won the Best Music Award at the 2019 Boston Film Festival for his score to the movie Wailing, as well as scoring the multi-award winning horror feature Followed and the Emmy-awarded documentary feature Paradise Reef, The World is Watching. Jason has had songs featured on MTV, The Real World, and Teen Mom. He wrote A Sporting Chance for the movie Eddie the Eagle, Lady Phones for the movie G.I. Joe Retaliation, and co-wrote Handy Candy for the movie Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children with composers Matthew Margeson and Mike Hyam. 
Right now, Jason is writing music for multiple film projects, mixing scores, most recently for BAFTA-supported composer Emily Rice, and collaborating with other songwriters and artists as a co-writer and or producer, with a view to creating songs for sync licenses, for the artists themselves, or to be cut by other artists. Jason also produces backing tracks for Kids Bop, collaborating with Gary Phillips. So please welcome Jason Suda to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jason, are you ready to rock, dude? I am. I am. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are and whatever time it is where you are. How's it going, Lidge? It's going great. So uh, let's see. I guess now you're in Los Angeles. You're, I'm not calling across the big pond there. I'm, a, I'm calling, crawling. <laughs> I'm crawling. Right. Calling across the, the land. <laughs> yeah. Across the, yeah. Perhaps I should preface this by reminding our listeners that... Um, that both you and I got zero sleep last night, so we're probably going to be saying all kinds of kooky things during this interview. That's our excuse, anyway. <laughs> you know, we we'll probably still be kooky even if we had slept. But yeah, that's right. Definitely, about- I, I would definitely be kooky. I'm, yeah, everybody knows that about me. <laughs> well, same same here. I'm I'm kind of known for that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what an impressive list of stuff you've done. Pretty amazing. Um, I've always been really fascinated by. You know, composing for film uh, and and creating music with that in mind, and so I'm excited to talk to you more about it. Tell us about you. You know how you got started in this. Did you start out studying music, and then you know how did you find your way over at Hans Zimmer's studio? I mean, it's uh, it's quite a crazy story. I mean, I started off uh, going way back to childhood. I started off playing piano and and uh, writing songs from probably the age of seven or something like that, like silly little songs about nightmares and things like that. Um, and then I, I, I probably when I was about 12 or so, I had a really great piano teacher who, um, he helped me learn how to write songs properly and structure songs because I kept giving up piano cause I hated learning scales and I couldn't really sight read and things like that. So yeah. he, he, I was really lucky that he, um, really nurtured me and, uh, taught me about chord sequences and like every week he'd set, he'd, he'd like give me two chords and say, go write a song for me by next week, starting with those chords and things Ooh. like that. That's a smart is, idea. Yeah, yeah. And then he also had a little studio in his house. So then once I had a couple of songs, he recorded me. And, uh, you know, so that was really fun. And and um, and that got me interested in in recording, actually. So then I, um, you know, my, he encouraged my parents to get me a, a quote unquote proper keyboard because I had a Casio, like a, you know, a home keyboard before that. So he... What's what's not proper about a Casio? Oh, right, right. No, now they are quite proper. Pro- right. Uh, they're proper. Um, but like he meant something like a well, I actually got a Korg M1 secondhand um, and learned how to sequence on that, which is really old school. I mean, it's like uh, you know uh, everything on a tiny little screen and making patterns and like loops, I guess you'd call them that. Anyway, so yeah, so I was doing that for a while, and then and and uh, being in bands and at college, I I actually didn't study music; I studied psychology. Um, because of the fact that at least in the UK to do a music degree, even if it's a music technology degree, you have to have, um, certain qualifications in, um, like music theory and things like that, which I never, (laughs) I never passed. So I wasn't able to do that. So then I, I did psychology as my kind of fallback, but I was, um, doing music for all the drama production, a lot of the drama productions at college oh, um, cool. and stuff like that. And I was in a band at college as well. And, you know, so this all kind of like, you know, um, one thing and, and uh, you know, I, like anyone, I guess I ended up where I am because of a bunch of little serendipitous meetings. Like I, I had a performance on the student radio station and uh, one of the other artists performing is a singer songwriter called Amy Wodge, who, uh, you know, I asked her for her advice and she's, she recommended me to some places in London to play. And like, we kept in touch over the years and I would like fill her in on what I've been up to. And, and so she helped me get into the London scene and then I ended up moving to London and singing there. Amy Wodge, if you don't know, um, she's now a Grammy winning, I think at least Grammy nominated, but I think Grammy winning songwriter. She writes with Ed Sheeran a lot and she did his first record and um, which is, you know, amazing to be in touch with her still after all this time. And, and she's always really encouraging. And, um, yeah. anyway, and then another random meeting I was in, uh, uh, in Cardiff, I went to college in Cardiff in Wales and, uh, a friend of mine invited me to see her friend playing in a band. Uh, he was a keyboardist and the singer was James Blunt, who you might know from you're beautiful. 
Um, and yeah. at the time, at the time, he was completely unknown in the UK, and he, we were in a room of like five people or something like that in the audience, um, maybe ten. I don't know. Hardly anyone was there, and and so because we were friends with the band, we got chatting with him after and took him out. And I asked him for advice as well. And he, his first thing he said was, "Go to America, mate. You know, uh, I've been struggling here for a long time, and nobody really gets one." And I was ha- personally having the same kind of experience as well, um, where I might get some. Uh, inroads into some of the UK record industry and then they'd be like oh your music's too American mate you know because a lot of my music was like uh, Goo Goo Dolls or um, Counting Crows or uh, you know that The Fray I guess now you know that mm-hmm. kind of stuff mm-hmm. and uh, for some reason even though that music was popular in the UK uh, they they just I mean that they just didn't know what to do with me so then after a few people saying go to America go to America then I started like coming to America and uh, trying to get into like music conferences and playing at you know uh, very very fringe at South by Southwest like as in it, you know it's barely in Austin the kind of venue yep, I was yep. playing at you know? <laughs> um, and then uh, anyway I, I know I'm rambling on a few different tangents but it was just all these little random meetings because um, and anyway so uh, one one time when I was in LA this is the the main the main story i guess um a sure. friend of mine was was visiting from from london he was also a singer songwriter and we'd been friends for probably like 10 years at this point we met at a gig and kept in touch which you know i really encourage people to do cuz you know you're all can help each other as you as you grow in your career um anyway so he invites me out to to go for a beer and um uh, at the time i was i was uh, subletting with my wife and i felt bad leaving her on her own she's like no no go out you should go you know so I go out and he's got a friend with him and she's also from London and she's asking me like, what do you do? I was like, I'm a singer songwriter, but I'd love to do film music one day. Um, because a lot of people would also say to me that my music sounded very cinematic and I should try and get into film music. And um, anyway, mm-hmm. after, after you know being out with them for a couple of hours, uh, she's, she's asking me quite a lot of detailed questions about film music. And I asked her, how come she knows so much about it? And she's, oh, my dad's a composer. I was like, oh, okay, you know. Um, anyway, later that nice. night, she says, well, you know the end of the story. So it's no, not no, quite I don't. I, I, I'm yeah. guessing at this point. <laughs> yeah. So then she's like, oh, my dad's studio is down the road if you guys want to come check it out. And I was like, yes, yeah, I love studios. And so it's two in the morning. Uh, we're in Santa Monica and we get out of the car and she's pointing to like that building's my dad's, that building's my dad, like four or five buildings or something like that, like half a pretty much half a block. Um, and then we go in and there's an armed security guard. And she says, oh, can, can I show these guys in my dad's room? And he's like, yeah, no worries. So we go in and there's all those like massive movie posters that are like six foot tall. And uh, we go into this room and sit down and, and I'm like, who's your dad? And she goes, Hans Zimmer. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So my mind was blown, you know. And uh, so she was, you know, she was amazing. So, um, so she said, you know, if I'm seriously interested, then once I had my green card, um, because you need a, a work permit even yeah. to intern for free at, or whatever, um, then let me know, you know. So, so I was like, yeah, and and um, so yeah. So a few months later, I got I I got in touch with her, and uh, she got me an interview with the studio manager, and um, the studio manager was like, oh, you seem normal, but not too normal. So you know, start on <laughs> Monday great. kind of thing. Perfect. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, yeah. So um, and I was so thankful. I mean, I was probably driving her, um, her Zoe, her name is uh, nuts. Cause like every day I was like, thank you so much. You've changed my life. You know, yeah, and right. she's like, you don't have to keep thanking me, but, um, you know, and I was determined to do her proud cause I, I believe I was the first person that she gave that kind of opportunity to. That's um, such a great story too. You know, it's such yeah. a great reminder of like, you know, whatever it takes, it doesn't matter how you yeah. um, find your way to the open door opportunity. Just, just put yourself out there enough different ways until you finally Something yeah. just appears. Yeah, and and you know, telling people what what you want to do with your life, and you know, I mean, not not hopefully not annoying them, but like if I if I hadn't said to Zoe, oh, I'd love to do film music one day, then I might never have, you know, known. You know what I mean? Like this path might not have ever opened up if I just said I was a singer songwriter, and that would be the end. Of, could have been the end of it, you know. Absolutely, and I just um, wrote down a great quote: um, "Be normal, but not too normal." That's really right, good yeah. advice for getting into the studios. Yes, exactly. And knowing when to be normal and when to be silly, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then so then after that, um, and Zoe also gave me a heads up of like who's at the studio and who you should like 
no. And, and uh, you know, she told me, like, my dad doesn't like cold Coke. So whenever you get him a Coke, get it from the cupboard, not the fridge. You know, things like that to, to help me avoid getting fired, which is really helpful. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and also she was just really honest with me about what it might be like. And, um, you know, that I'd probably never see my wife again, which was pretty much true <laughs> for, yeah, for a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the time as well, I was, I think I was 29 and she said, you know, she was asking me like, are you sure you want to do this at, at that age? Because everyone else is going to be like 20, 21 and, and uh, you know, and I was like, no, I'm, I mean, what a great opportunity. I'm not going to turn my nose up because I'm like, you know, nothing, I didn't really feel like anything was beneath me. I was just so happy to be there and, you know, clean the toilet, whatever I would do any, I mean, I didn't literally do that, but I would clean up in the bathroom and yeah. pick up stuff. And, you know, I wanted it to be a place that if anyone just randomly walked in, they'd be impressed with, with how organized it was. And, well, that's, and that's that, good thinking. That's a, that's a definitely a technique that I recommend for everybody is just having that sense of like, yeah, make, make the place seem a little better than when you arrived, if you can. Yeah, exactly. And and people notice it, you know. So then on my second morning I was there, um, I got called into Matthew Margison's room. Um, and I was thinking he's just gonna ask me to get him lunch or a coffee or some kind of runner thing. And then he's he's on the phone and I walk in and he's like, Come in, sit down, yeah. And then uh, he's got my resume in front of him and and then he interviewed me and asked me like, How much do you know about Cubase? And I was like, Oh yeah, Cubase is my main thing and he's like, How much do you know about Pro Tools? I was like, uh I can hit record. I, I, I knew nothing about Pro Tools at that point. Hmm. Um, and then he was like, well, that's fine. I can teach you that. And then he basically hired me to, on a trial basis to be his assistant. So then I worked as an intern for, for the studio and then also for Matt uh, for a few months and then transitioned then into just being Matt's assistant. So that, yeah, so I guess I impressed enough people just from that first day of, you know, cleaning up after everyone and whatever and having a good vibe, I guess, because, you know, because Matt was looking for an assistant and he was asking people like, have you, you know, because a lot of the people at Hans's studio and I'm sure many others will, um, will, um, will pick people that are interns, you know, to, to join yeah. their team and, and yep. ask around like any cool interns at the moment and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I mean, I, re- I can't recommend highly enough to just work your ass off, um, in whatever position you're in because people do notice and people see your work ethic and and that's like more important than anything else like nobody listened to my music like they don't care about your music at that yeah. level at that point you know they just cared about like how hard i was willing to work and and uh and and whether i fit in with their team so so a couple of thoughts about that one is showing up at the age of 29 you know, mm-hmm. it, it may have made you stand out a little bit against some of the younger guys um, or girls there, just because yeah. you know you, you're a little more mature and you you're you know you're maybe a little less spastic than than at 21 or whatever. I know yeah. I was pretty pretty spastic at that point, um, but also you know showing up with the same attitude as if you were 21, where you're like, I'm willing to do the intern stuff. I just have the experience to know and care about it, you know, looking good and sounding good and, and being a good experience. And and I understand being quiet in the space and all that. What about yeah. this, man? I mean, some people might hear that and, and, and they might think, oh, that's awesome. But, you know, I, I, I would suggest that most of the time when somebody shows up at that age, they're like, I've got to get paid. I've got to have a job now. I've already done the, you know, I've already like yeah. blown my opportunity to, to do stuff without income. What, what tips do you have for the rock stars about you know, how did you manage to survive through that or anything? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, there's there's a few factors. I mean, uh, which which probably might not be that helpful. But I had uh, it was only a couple of weeks of of not getting paid at all. Interesting. Um, but uh, uh, my, you know, I was married and my wife had a job which helped as well um, a lot. You know, because she was a nurse and uh, you know, if but but if I was on my own. I still would have somehow found a way, I think. Like I, I had friends who were uh, living in, um, like literally sharing a room with someone, not just sharing yeah. a house and stuff yeah. like that. You would have and I know on it's a couch. A, yeah, yeah. You know, keeping your costs down, uh, you know. Um, and I mean, we were lucky as well because 10 years ago, it was like 1500 a month for a one bedroom in LA. And now it's like three grand. So, yeah. uh, and I, I, and I know the salaries haven't doubled in that time. So I know it's a lot harder now than it was uh, when I moved here. Um, but I feel like, you know, um, friends can help you. Um, you know, I, um, I had a friend who actually moved down here from, 
I was speaking of interns, actually, I had a friend who, or I have a friend, she's, she's still my friend. Uh, I did an album with Sylvia Massey as when I was an artist. Oh, cool. And, um, yeah, which was amazing. I learned so much from her. And, and actually, one of her interns at the time, who's now a recording engineer and a composer assistant, Laurie Castro, who's awesome, uh, she, she moved down to LA and, like, you know, she stayed with us for a little bit. She stayed with some friends and, and she actually worked at Handa's studio as well. Just, again, just like, for me, she impressed me when she was an intern up at Sylvia's and she was working at Burger King and like doing whatever it, she could to, to supplement her income. And she was, you know, so great in the studio that I was more than happy to recommend her to uh, remote control. And that just, just that same thing of like, I'd never heard her music, didn't know what she was like as an engineer, but she was so great as an intern and as a, you know, I could see how hard a worker she was. So then she worked at the studio for a, a few years, I think. And so yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, working side jobs, you know, and I did, I did some of that as well. Like I, I used to do these um, uh, custom wedding songs, which I still would love to do, but I just haven't had time. But where, um, you know, I, I, I put some adverts on Facebook on groups uh, on um, people that were newly engaged, and then I would get calls or emails from them and um, charge them a few hundred dollars for a song that I wrote specifically about their story. Oh, that's great, man! I, ju- yeah. I just did that for my cousin's wedding last oh, cool. year. It was super yeah. fun. Of course, I, I was able to come up with all the content too. Mm. And um, I wasn't going to not get paid if they didn't like it. Fortunately, right. <laughs> they did like it. But what a great idea, like yeah, writing yeah. custom songs for people. So that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. You know, when you're learning piano and you're composing for um, drama, you yeah. know, were you writing musicals? How did you feel about lyric? Was I writing musicals? You mean... Uh like musical theater kind of stuff? Or? Yeah, in other words, yeah. Uh, in other words, were you focused on the instrumental part of writing music or were you mm. also getting involved in lyric writing and song composition? Yeah, I mean, when I when I was doing the singer-songwriter thing uh, at the forefront, I would I would write the lyrics as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I I'd, I'd write the song pretty much and and my my drummer um Matt Collins was kind of like a producer as well, so he he would often like suggest that I change certain lines that he thought weren't great and stuff like that and help, you know, finish off things. And, um, but yeah. And, and when I co-write now, I'm, um, I don't know, it's, it, it's, I'm, I'm probably not a lyricist first and foremost. I'd say, say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at coming up with lines if somebody's stuck on a line or like suggesting, okay, how about for first two, you, you start with this and stuff yeah. like that. Like I, I'm more kind of solution. I, I'm more focused on coming up with solutions to the problems that they're having with the lyrics, I guess, rather than like helping writing that many lines. So I'm yeah. definitely, yeah, more involved in the music side and the arrangement and, uh, and, you know, making that have as much impact as I can, you know, that kind of stuff. So what, if, if I was to just say, what are a couple of first thoughts that come to mind about a typical um, solution to a lyric problem that you might address? Oh, wow. What would you say? Um, and how do you feel about cliches? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Those are great questions. Oh dear. I don't know. I mean, I'd have to think about the specific songs themselves, but that just something might jump out at you. Like if the first verse is about like, you know, who am I to do this? Who am I to say that? And then, you know, the second verse, I was like, well, why don't you make it? Who are you to say this? Who are you to say that? You know, it nice. might, it sounds pretty obvious now, but yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or uh, something I learned from Sting, not li- not directly, but you know, I've heard him talk about the bridge and how the bridge is about often about a new perspective on something. Yeah. So like trying to trying to do that kind of thing. Uh, so like, if the song's all about like feeling hopeless about something, then maybe the bridge is like, but what if I try, uh, you know, like a change of tack kind of idea. Yeah. Or like a, like in a Harry Nilsson song, you know, it's all about like feel good playing with your dog and then the bridge is about divorce and you're like, what? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing, you know, cool. Oh, what was the other question about? Um, cliches. Oh, um, yeah. Cliches. That's, yeah, that's I mean, actually something I've been trying to address in songwriting recently. And I yeah. find it's a challenge. Yeah. And, and also, you know, for every, I guess not for every rule, there's a, but if you look at someone like Max Martin, I mean, he's, he's so adamant about keeping like, things simple and and it doesn't really matter like if the lyrics completely make sense especially when he started and his english wasn't as good as it is now and like hit me hit me baby one more time you know so i mean yeah i mean i guess it depends on the style of song like if it's if it's a a wordy song that's like um very metaphorical then you might avoid 
a cliche, but if it's like an upbeat pop song where people are just listening to the beat really and singing along without really caring about the act, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I wouldn't want to be like snobbish about it. I think it, it, depending on the context, though, I think as long as it's whatever the whoever the artist is, if if they feel comfortable with it and it sounds genuine from them, then you know I wouldn't uh, I that's wouldn't good. rule out having something cheesy. You know what I mean? That's a good that's a good answer. I like that. Mm. And it was an onyx. I wasn't planning on asking you that question, so I've totally put you on the spot with it. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. Got got me in uh, completely. Uh, uh, well, yeah. All right. On the so, spot. Yeah. Go so let, yeah. let me ask you this: What um you know what was your experience when you started working with Matt? And um you know what does he do? What were some of the yeah. first thing you learned about the process of of composition? So yeah, before I'd um. Before I had worked for him, you know, I I thought I knew Cubase, but I really had no idea compared to the depth that they that that composers use it at. You know, um, he so he's yeah he's a composer. He's um, and I the first things I learned from him, uh, or that I can remember when he would let me sit and watch him writing, which was probably the, one of the most invaluable things for and, just and, being able to, to watch someone, you know. Yeah, and sorry, and yeah. what was yeah. what were some of the first film compositions you remember? You're like, oh, wow, he was working on such and such, if you're allowed to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so when I first started working for him, um, he was doing uh, he was he was doing a video game and then he started on uh, his own, I think it was his second feature film, which was a, a sci-fi film called Skyline. Okay. And uh yeah, so um yeah, so that was a, that was what he was working on and just just watching him writing uh you know, I when I was arranging my songs, I would usually go through the song from left from start to finish with whatever instrument I was doing. So if I was I'd start the piano, then I might do the bass all the way through, then I might do the guitars, the drum or whatever it is, you know, I'd do it from from the beginning to the end and that was it. Mm-hmm. Whereas watching and I don't know if Matt's unique in this or not, but I the way he would flesh out his his tracks would be you know he might start with a piano map which is just like a sketch on a piano where you pretty much have everything that you might end up with like you you know you might have the main chords and you might have a melody on top and mm-hmm. whatever um and then he would he would take the i wish you could see my hands because that would help um <laughs> he would he would take the piece in sections from so like you might go from like bar you know the, the first bar till like the 17th bar or whatever the first section was and then he would he would build it up from the bass up. So he would start with the basses, then the cello, then the you know the strings, and the and then he'd move down to the brass or whatever the woodwinds. And he and and he might not do all the percussion at that point, but he would he would basically build it section by section. And then that was so great because then every transition feels seamless because you know you, you know where you're coming from and um, how big it is at that point and. You know, rather than doing like all the strings for the whole piece and all the bra, you know, it just, right, I, right. It, I mean, it, I don't know if that's making sense, but as soon as I started doing that as well, it, you know, it made a massive difference. And I do that with songs now as well. It's just, um, yeah. And then um, the first few, the fir- initially I was just primarily his technical assistant. Um, so that like meant learning how his studio worked. And at that point, um, he had probably 13 odd computers in his rig because this is before. Uh, computers were, I think his sequencer was like a quad core, but at that time, 10 years ago, that was like crazy, you know? (laughs) So like he had a lot of older computers. Um, So yeah, learning about how all that worked and and becoming indispensable was like the thing um, which he recommended. Like, so, so even when I wasn't technically supposed to be working, I would pretty much be there learning stuff when he wasn't there. And, and that's what he wanted me to be doing, you know, getting to know his, his studio. Yeah. So that I when mean, that something is, goes wrong. Yeah. That is a critical thing. And it's funny, I, I try to offer that to um, a lot of interns and sometimes they'll, they'll come back and kind of do their own thing in the studio, but it's pretty rare. It's, it's, yeah. it's not always everybody who will just spend a bunch of extra time in the studio if you know, if the session isn't happening. Yeah, yeah. And and I was so lucky, like the random conversation. I mean, firstly, um, the studio manager, um, Zarina Russell, encouraged me in that first interview. She's like, make sure you introduce yourself to people and don't be afraid to talk to people. Yeah, and yeah. Which I was so glad she did because then, I mean, I was going around going, hi, I'm Jason, I'm the new intern, which, you know, looking back <laughs> at how, how meaningless that was because there's a new intern every week or something. Um, but yeah, and then, and I would, yeah, you know, there'd be people out having a smoke break in the in the 
car park and I'd start chatting with them. And I remember this one guy, um, Adam Schmidt, who, who's an engineer and he was an assistant engineer at the time, encouraging me to like, make sure that you're here at night because it's a whole different vibe at the studio at night. And you know, you'll, people will be more open to you hanging out. And, you know, so then I got to hang out with people while they were mixing and stuff like that, which was so great, you know, and, and just, just also, I mean, I genuinely wanted to be there and to learn as much as I could, but also then people see you as someone who's willing to go above and beyond and isn't just like looking at the clock. Oh, it's five o'clock. I'm going home now. You know? Right, right. Exactly. I did a mic shootout for my vocals in the studio and tried 20 different microphones from the Shure SM7 to a vintage Neumann U67, but was impressed that my favorite of all was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos 2 large diaphragm condenser. Handcrafted in California, Roswell Mics brings you inspired design and attention to detail to help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful microphones, including the Mini K47 for only $349 at Roswell ProAudio.com. Let me ask you a question about building the song because I think that was a really fascinating insight. Um, okay. a, cu- a couple of thoughts about that is in order to do what you're describing, to build a song through multiple instruments, you're obviously talking about using software yeah. samples and, and synths and things like that to, to build it and create it. Because um, I imagine... Maybe you could do that in the studio with real drums and real bass, but it would just be trickier to get something set up and, and keep it the yes. way it is. Although yeah, I'm super that, inspired yeah. to go try that now that you just said that. <laughs> I mean, maybe I would, if I was doing it in a, with a band, I would I would do the, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't do it like that, but I'd probably do the drums all, all in one go. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, but you, oh, I was going to say, another thought is it's a little bit like saying, well, look, if you're going to play a chord here, and yeah. you're gonna, you want to like play the chords all the way through the song to get from the beginning to the end. It's trickier if you're just going to play just you know the first the root note all the way through, and then just the third all the way through, and then just the fifth or whatever you know your chord arrangement is. So it yeah. kind of makes sense in that respect when the chord for a section is this whole big you know stacked from the lowest bass through the percussion and and horns and stuff. Yeah, and it's also because because we're programming it, you know, so. Um, cause I mean, I'm like when you record the real orchestra, you might go in sections, but that's only because of like t- a tempo change or some other reason, you know, otherwise they'd play it all the way through. Yeah. Um, but, but when you're programming it, you can only do one. I mean, you can do multiple instruments at once, but then they're all going to have the same, uh, you know, expression, modulation, dynamic stuff, performance as well, you know? So, so for me, like doing them all separately, I can give them all a little bit, I can try and make it a bit more humanized because I can, uh, you know, have them swell in the same place, but not, maybe not quite exactly right. You know, cause I'll, I'll have, um, I have these faders, uh, these MIDI controller faders. So for things like the volume swells and the, of the strings and stuff like that, yeah, you know, I'll be, yeah. I'll be doing that in real time, like a fader move on a mixing console. Um, so that's all part of what adds up to it feeling like an emotional performance and things. And, and I might even do, um, like I have a few different li- uh, sound libraries for the string, so I might layer up those. And also I could just cut and paste the same violin part, but I, I, I don't. Like I might cut and paste the notes, but then I'll play with the, uh, the performance side. Uh, interesting. You know, so stuff like that, yeah. I understand that. And, and um, you know, when I've tried that here too, I do find it's more. it sounds a little bit more realistic if I do one, one of the strings at a time yeah, exactly. And then stack yeah. them. But the problem for somebody like me is not being a composer, I haven't sort of worked out what the harmonic structure is. I yeah. just start with one and sort of wind my way through as an overdub and then then layer on top of it. Um, if that sounds like you understand what I'm getting at, I'm oh, guessing yeah. you must be working sometimes with people like me who aren't a composer first. Yeah. How do you guide somebody through that sort of like stumble through what it what it might be process and still do the one at a time ness? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time in those situations they might just sort of kick back while I while I do the strings and things like that, mm-hmm. or they might. Okay. Um, I, like, I like sometimes the take over, yeah, <laughs> kick yeah, me out of the bit, chair. A little bit of that, or I, I've worked a lot with um, a producer called J J Two. Um, J Singh is his his real name. He's he's originally a DJ. He's from the UK as well, but he's um, he was in New York for a while as a DJ. But out, he's out here in LA and he does a lot of trailer music as well as producing artists and 
doing a lot of hip hop and Indian trap as his current project. But oh, cool. so I've, I've, I've worked with him as his, like, uh, one of his orchestra people. Funny enough, even though I'm like for a lot of the people that are in the film music world, I'm their like synth and production person. But, um, but yeah, but he'll sing stuff and, or he'll like play in the top line on his keyboard and then I'd play it in properly or, or like I'd, I'd flesh it out. So we might sketch the idea together, you know, or he might mm-hmm. give me, he might give me his, his logic session or his MIDI file, which has his, what he thinks the string arrangement should be from, you know, what his vision is for it. And then I'll, I'll use that as my guide and then maybe tweak a couple of things. But so essentially yeah. like it's the same melody, but I might like have a different harmony or something or add something to it to, to make it sound fatter and stuff like that. Cause yeah. there's, you know, it's not just layering up instruments, but there's certain tricks with, um, uh, like just, just the way that you play the chords on different instruments can make it sound bigger than if you didn't do it that that way, that kind yeah. of stuff, which I, which I learned from Matt as well, you know. So. Well, it seems that there's always something in there that the ear tunes into is that's the movement I'm hearing, even if there's a whole yeah. bunch around it, you know. Yeah, and it's also like what what sounds good. I mean, you know, sometimes in theory you should do this thing or that can't be right, you know, you, you can't do that, that's wrong or whatever. But then if it sounds good and it works with the piece, then I, I would want to, especially now that I've been doing it a few years, I feel a bit more confident to be able to say, yeah, I did try it the you know, quote unquote, right way, but I feel like this way it sounded better. So yeah, cool, cool. Kind of stuff, yeah. All right. So um, here's a question for you: What uh, do you think makes a great film composer, and how would somebody know if they should consider it? Hmm. I mean, I I definitely like look up to Hans, and I know I know uh, I haven't worked with him directly apart from like uh, as an intern, but you know, and he, and I think he knows who I am. But he, he, you know, when, I'm not going to pretend that like we're we know each other that well or anything, but I right. definitely really look up to him and, and like watch a lot of his interviews and, or anytime I've been in a room with him. Well, and he him has the, talk, the great master class now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the exactly. Whole video course. Yeah. And I've, you know, he, he, uh, Matt, my old, my old boss, Matt Marjorie, who we're talking about, like he, Matt was working on uh, one of the pirates films as one of Hans's guys. And so I was in, I was in the room sometimes when Hans would come in and give Matt feedback or like there'd be a, a gap in a queue that Matt, but the director didn't like and Hans were just playing something and it was like, but yeah, so what I think makes a great film composer, I mean, looking at someone like Hans, um, you know, definitely how he starts every project, like he doesn't know what to do and he's going to start with, he's going to start from nothing and try and find something unique for that project, which I've definitely taken on board as much as I can, you know, rather than just bashing in something that might work or whatever, you know, so I like the, the fact that he, um, what he gives to every project is is starting from from scratch, you know, and trying to have something custom, you know, whether and maybe making custom instruments for that mm-hmm. uh, project or, um, yeah, and and then just like always being willing to learn and and being, uh, you know, driven to uh, tell the story because it's 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 kind of like a service industry job rather than like being an artist where you're, you know, so. Yeah. Well, our job as composing is making the director and the filmmakers and the you know eventually the studio happy um rather than like going i mean there might be the odd piece where you're like no this is what i think it should be and you know but generally you'll be going back to the drawing board a lot and um or at least you have to be willing to do that you know so you can't let it so that's something i learned and i'm glad i learned quite early on was you can't let yourself get crushed every time someone says oh that's not right or that's not working yeah. for me or you know, that's not the right vibe. I thought it, and, and a lot of the time they'll tell you like, go do this and you do it. And then they're like, why did you do that? Or, you know, now that I've heard it, it's wrong. You know, so you'll, you have to be able to um, let that wash over you and, and still keep that enthusiasm to keep going back to the drawing board. And it might be over the course of like half a year or something, you know? Yeah. So I think that's important. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm still writing down your quote there. You, you can't let yourself be crushed. Get mm. crushed every time someone says no, that's not for me. That's a great yeah. quote. <laughs> yeah, because I used to take things really personally. Like, I mean, I remember, um, you know, when I was uh, promoting an EP once at, at a music conference in in the UK in Manchester, um, and a producer very kindly listened to one of my tracks, and then he had a lot of notes for me, and I, and he was like, you know, it sounds like it's too low for your voice, like nothing mean. Like he was trying to be helpful, you know. And yeah. I remember just like you know being. S- like defensive and like say yeah but blah blah you know 
I think I was like 20 at the time or 20, early 20s anyway. But um, so you needed another you know, nine years before you were Yeah, ready. yeah. So, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, you need to be able to take people's criticism and, and uh, you know, and, and that's something, I, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody's more experienced, they're going to be right, but you, ha- you can't be defensive about it. You have to like, or, or try, like that's something I learned from Matt as well as being willing to try any, any idea. And he was, he would often turn to me and say like, what do you think of this? Or do you have any suggestions? And he might think, oh, I don't think that's going to work, but he would try it. And then I'd learn why it didn't work or maybe it did work, you know? So, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're just a songwriter, well, sorry, yeah. no, no disrespect to, to songwriters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be one myself one day when I grow up. Yeah. But um, <laughs> if you're a songwriter, you know, you, you are trying to make the right choice for the listener. So it's just you and the listener, but you know, then you're producing or co-writing and you're working with an artist. Now you're trying to make the right choice. That's right for the artist. That's right for the listener. You, you, yeah. you go to the level of making a film score and it's a massive coordinated effort. Typically, you know, especially the stuff you're talking about, there's a yeah. lot of pieces to get right so that you have a great film. And I'm always struck by that repeatedly when I go watch, you know, big production films that really were done well. There's yeah. just so many elements that go into getting it I right. Know. I have no idea. Yeah, there's so. I mean, the timing, the editing, the you know, and then that that's constantly changing as well. So then you have to change the music to fit with that. So even yeah. if music's approved, you know, you're still always having to you know, and 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 also the budget and stuff like that. There's so much more money. Like when you when you're recording a song at someone's home studio and it doesn't work, then it's just like fine, write another one or something. You know. Right. Um, whereas when it's like a hundred million dollar film and, and you have to deliver stuff to an orchestrator because you're recording an orchestra for a hundred grand a day or whatever it is, you know, now's not the time for experimentation. Yeah. 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 You have to, or you have to have that out of the way first, you know? So yeah, exactly. So that that by the time you get to that point where you're recording, you know, it's all pretty much nailed and you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Timing. Um, all right. Well, so here's another one. Um, you know, I mean, you, you kind of, already spelled out a little bit what a film composer does and some of the skills in the studio. How would you say it's similar to or different from recording a rock band in a studio? Um, well, there's a lot, there's a lot more time on your own, I guess, you know, um, I like, I like being in films where you, where you might be on a team with other composers and, and you do get to like try out ideas as a group or like, but there's a, but it's pretty much, you're still writing on your own or there might be someone with you, like saying, what about this? What about that? Whereas like with a rock band, well, if you're, if you're just recording the rock band, it's, I guess it's different than if you're producing them or, you know, whether you did pre-production with them or not, but it's definitely a lot more collaborative, um, working with a band as far as the physical act of getting the music recorded and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, uh, or at least it's more collaborative over, you know, uh, it's not like I I've arranged everything and then I go okay here's your bass part here's your lead guitar part you know and and making them play what I wrote you know um, but then there is a kind of in between ground where uh, say if if we're doing like on Kingsman for example where there's a lot of guitars um, we'll do sessions with uh, session guitarists usually um, uh, to replay like I I might have or like some of the other composers play guitar we might have played in uh, some a few guitar parts which will which will be like as a guide and then we'll get a, a real guitarist to come and like <laughs> re- replace it all. Nice. Uh, and, and also, you know, we, we'd be recording with like virtual amps. And so it's, you know, it'd be nice to go to a real studio and record uh, with actual amps and mics and, you know, stuff like that. And I, I really enjoy that part of it because I've, uh, I've produced some of those sessions or I've co-produced like uh, Al Clay was the score mixer for, for Kingsman and, and often he'd be he would be producing those sessions with the session players, like when we had the drummer come in or the guitarist, and I'd be that like I'd be there kind of representing Matt if Matt was in London with the orchestra kind of thing. Because as Matt's assistant, I would know like Matt would rather you tried it like this or that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like co-producing, but also learned so much from watching Al working with these guys. And uh, so yeah, I mean it's di- it's different, but there's there's a lot of overlap and there's things that I've learned from from each one. Like I remember when, when I worked with Sylvia, um, one thing she'd always have us do is once we had the master take and we, we had a couple of safety takes, she'd always, for every instrument, she'd make us do a, um, a fun take where you'd sing a different melody or, or the drummer would do fills every two bars and stuff like that um, as a way of like getting some spontaneity back into the song. Because when you're a band and you've probably been playing the same song for a long time before you get in the studio, 
you know, there's a risk of it sounding a bit sterile or a right. bit like over, uh, you know, just losing that live feels, you know, everyone's playing to a click, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So she, I mean, I hope I'm not breaching an NDA with her, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I just thought that was such a great idea because then she'd cut in, even if it was just like one bar of like my vocal uh, where I sang something different or like I really went for a high note that I wouldn't normally or like the drummer just did a triplet fill that was ridiculous, but it was great just having that little bit of excitement cut in, you know. So Yeah, that's so a good, yeah. good tip. I'm going to start using that one. Thank you, yeah. Sylvia. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, so I would, I, I've suggested that at a few of these overdub sessions as well. Like once we have what we need, you know, if there's time, like why don't we do something like this? I mean, they're following the composer's music, so it's not necessarily that they're completely improvising but like stuff on the percussion you know they could do an over the top take or you know like mm -hmm. when we did cello it'd be like oh let's do a take where you're doing a full-on yo-yo ma impression where you're sliding between like so many notes and then you might use just a little bit of that just to give it a bit more life you know so, yeah so yeah. just to, just for clarity's sake um i think yeah. one of the things that i first discovered about film composition is the way the process starts out in the studio and you're using midi instruments but then that becomes the roadmap for going in and and maybe not always but sometimes or often recording real yeah. orchestral instruments that are recreating that um so that's what you're talking about there i i think and then also um how often are you recording like a full orchestra versus sort of building and stacking from a, a bunch of small ensembles um, in, as orchestral stuff yeah i mean if it's orchestral stuff um you know, if it's, I mean, the, the projects that I'm doing as a composer myself uh, at this point are not, are not a big enough budget to record anyone basically, but myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but when it's a big, when it's a big enough budget where they are recording an orchestra, then we will, we will do like everyone in the room or, uh, you might have the strings separate from the brass, like a, in different sessions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so we rarely will build up from, uh, like you might on a pop record. Um, uh, but then sometimes on smaller budget stuff, you might just record a soloist and then have that mixed in with the, like you might just do like a solo violinist and like just, just to get more of that real texture and that grit that you could mix in with the samples. Um, right. Or, that, that, that's a trick I remember learning too. So you use your, yeah. use your string pad, but then add one, maybe two real violins on it. And it really makes it sound more real. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, what else did we do? Or maybe like uh, there was this one project I was working on earlier this year where we were doing a string quartet. So then we would have just recorded that as a, you know, and we, and all the fake uh, strings we did with a string quartet sound or like a, a chamber, which is like a smaller orchestra. So, you know, like it's, it's good, it's good if you can have, have an idea in, at the beginning of what, what sound you want as far as how big it, you know, if it's going to be an epic sounding massive orchestra or if it's going to be small and then, you know the samples can match because because they'll use they'll often use the samples to reinforce the real orchestra as well, just like you do with drums and sample uh, reinforcement. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you're so, saying that if you know ahead of time that you will be yeah. recording a full orchestra versus having yeah. to build it, you you will approach the MIDI stuff differently. Yeah. Yeah. Or you might use different sounds, or you know. But at the same time, there's some the way I was taught with uh, programming. Uh, for Matt or any of the people I've worked with is that we'll still, um, even if we know it's being recorded, um, I'll still always make it sound as good as I can with the fake stuff. You know, I won't be like, oh, it's just bashed in and you can hear the notes and then right. we're going to repla replace that. I mean, there's some people that work like that as well. I'm not saying that's wrong, but just the way I've worked is like, you just always, you have to be prepared that it will be recorded. So like your MIDI has to make sense and, you know, that you can't, you want to try and be mindful of the fact that if you have a tempo change, you want there to be a little count in or, you know, stuff like that. Right, right. Um, but yeah, so yeah, have, having in mind what the lineup's going to be is definitely really helpful. Uh, nice. You know, at the beginning. Yeah. I like that. Another quote, your MIDI has to make sense. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. taken out of context. I didn't know how, <laughs> right, yeah. No, and, and still now, I mean, because Matt, when I was, you know, when I got to the point where I started being able to do some arranging and, and things like that, he would he would open up my sequences and look at them and, and, uh, you know, he's he's a very good teacher and he and he would criticize like because the first time I did did something, my MIDI regions went from the beginning to the end of the piece, even if like that one instrument only had four bars of data in it. Mm -hmm. and he's like, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, uh, so you have like a bar and then whatever's in it and then you cut it up. You know, so so you can visually see like when something's going to come in or out yep, like, yep. like you would with audio 
I mean, for audio, there's also the reason of the, the noise floor, but, but just so it's neat and you can tell when things, something, because, because all this stuff gets passed down a line, it's like a production line. So then if the orchestra, it gets your MIDI and it's a complete mess, then it makes their life hell, you know, and they're already under the gun. So um, well, it's, people appreciate it, you know, when you have, when you make the effort to have it clean and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. no, you. No, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's what with the uh, rock stars, just a reminder, we always have the inherent delay with Skype. So it's, it's always a little bit like having an awkward overseas call, but we're really awesome at this. So <laughs> thanks Jason. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's one of the things that is needed a lot in audio world. Like if you're going to hand off your tracks to a mixer, it's people, right. you know, might often consolidate to the beginning so that they're all the same length. Oh but yes, sorry. It's, we also do that as thing, well. yeah. it's also the yeah. thing that I, that frustrates me a little bit when I'm mixing. Cause I'm, I often am like, I'm going to go in and chop out all the stuff I don't want. Cause I want to see exactly mm. what you said, where I can just see at a glance that it just comes in here and it's not like a full track. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, very cool. Well, let's take a break for just a minute. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, I want to remind you that you'll find links to what we're talking about in the show notes, including a YouTube playlist that I put together of Jason's work, so you can go check it out. Um, we'll probably talk here in a minute uh, about Handy Candy from Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. And um, there's some great tracks in there, too. And we'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. The Spectra 1964 model was created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that have protected the free world for over half a century. The extremely stable high circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you clearer, punchier, dynamic recordings. During the height of record making, the 101 preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City Records. Record plant, bringing you the sounds of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same sound in your studio with the STX100 Mic Pre and STX500 EQ. Add the Cinemag Transformer BBDI and the C610 Complimeter, and you can have a truly awesome sound. Go to Spectra1964.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. 
Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Quisp Room ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisp Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Jason Suda joining us to talk about composing for film and uh, songwriting in general and recording in the studio. Jason, you ready to jam? I, I am. All right. So when we were off mic a moment ago, you started to have some things to say about, you know, just the, you know, the, you know, why share all this stuff back? Why, why teach all this stuff on the podcast like this? We're grateful for it, but sometimes we want to know why are you so generous? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I feel like I've learned so much from other people being generous to me and, and, you know, I've, I mean, I, I remember seeing something online where Andrew Sheps is like sharing his mixed template. He's like, oh, you know, it's fine. You know, it's going to sound different if you do it than what I do. And like not having a fear that if somebody knows how you did something, then all of a sudden you're going to be out of work. Right. You know, and I, I've, I've found that the people that are the most generous with, with sharing their techniques, like, because they're genuinely enthusiastic. Like, I'm just excited to share with someone that actually wants to listen to me talk about this stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, and, I, and I've learned so much from them. And they, they sometimes they learn stuff from me. And just having that kind of community where people are just giving, you know, it's like a back and forth thing rather than a sort of top down uh, situation, you know. Because uh, people that I've met who are really closed off and um, like... Uh, cloaking any anything that they've done or ever like they don't seem to be particularly happy anyway <laughs> you know uh and um yeah you know and it's like it's not like someone's gonna suddenly steal an idea of like starting off with the base and building up to the top line like that's not gonna mean that i don't get work anymore you know so, yeah well i like yeah. your, your quote you says it's not like you're gonna be out of work and my take or my follow-up with that is yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to be out of work anyway. It's about right. <laughs> it's about not not quitting as a result yeah, of that. That's another thing. Yeah, never giving up is another thing I'd say because you just don't like. I've I've definitely had times, and I know everyone has as well, of of uh, when you're just like, do I can I just do this anymore? Like, I'm never going to make money out of this or whatever. You know, doing music or or whatever it is. Um, and then it it always seems like just that moment where you're like really seriously give, thinking about quitting. Then something amazing or something good will happen. You know, and I've yeah. had I've had that happen myself. I've seen seen it happen to friends of mine who do this as well. Like, you know, one of my friends was thinking about like, you know, just do I want to stay in LA or should like go back to my hometown? And, and I'm always encouraging, like, no, just don't give up, you know. And then next thing, you know, that person's got their own TV show out of nowhere, or you know, from some random like previous contact and things like that. You know, so you just you just can't give up. You know, you just got to keep going. And plus, other people will give up. So the longer that you hold on, even if you're 30 and starting as an intern or 29, yeah, really. You know, it's like the the field gets uh, smaller as time goes by. So you've got more chance of succeeding the the longer you hang on. I think. Well, maybe I had an advantage starting out in this because I I started in architecture and then decided oh, cool. I didn't want to do architecture. I want to do music. So I sort of yeah. started all over again after a first round of college. Um, and, and I too was kind of embarking on my first real world, you know, stuff, interacting with major labels and all that about 27, 29. Yeah. Um, and when I was in architecture school, the, it used to be understood. It was like, oh, when you're, when you become an architect, you know, you, it's not true of everybody, but you know, it's traditionally, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, people like that, you know, this idea that like, you don't get to build your first building until you're like 50, you know? Right, right. And so I probably went to music. I'm like, okay, cool, man. I'll make my first record when I'm 50. No worries. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I thought about it, but now I'm looking back on it and seeing it right. more clearly. 
Um, no, totally. Yeah. It, I mean, that's another thing I was going to say is, is being patient as well. Cause yeah. you know, uh, I was, you know, having that opportunity and sitting in Matt's room, like I, I had to just, you know, I couldn't be like, all right, let me write a cue. I know what I'm doing. Like I had no idea, you know, so just, just having being paid, like once you're in the, in that jet stream or whatever, just like, you know, try not to get out of it and just, just ride it for a while and, and feel your way around it rather than like being aggressively like, you know, cause I had people from back home going, oh, you should be giving out your demo. You should be like, you know, handing out. Cause I'd have, you know, there's proper people walking around this studio that could in theory, like lift your career, but you can't be going around going, listen to this, listen to this, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It's a, you have to sort of, you know, so in some cases be patient and, uh, you know, it's, I know it sounds contradictory because I was like, you have to work hard. You have to be showing that, you know, your work ethic, but it's, it, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be self-promoting, but at the same time you do want to, like, sometimes people would ask me, what am I doing? And I'd tell them and I'd be happy about it. And they're like, oh, you're so enthusiastic. But, but I wouldn't be like pushing stuff down their throats if they weren't interested. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Well, you, you, it's okay to introduce yourself and be, cor- um, you know, gregarious, I guess, cordial, you know, just be, yeah. be polite, meet people. And then I think the the flip side is like when somebody does ask, be ready to tell them, you know, who you are yeah. and what you do and, you know, in a way that works or be smart and have your stuff available online, whatever it is, make right. it, make it really easy for people to learn about you when the, when the time is right. So then, yeah, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, and, and for me at least, um, sometimes it's the skill that you, you might think is not your main skill that gets you opportunities. Like, um, you know, yeah. I play guitar, but I'm not like, you know, I, I still don't know what the notes are. I just film. I mean, I know like four or five chords, but if, if you've held a note on like the fifth fret on on the second string, I don't know what note that is off the top of my head. You know what I mean? I'm still feeling my way around it after 20 odd years. But like my... It's uh, a D. Matt, Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Matt doesn't play guitar really, or at least he didn't really then. So he was like, oh, you play guitar, right? Because it was on my CV. And so I, like the first things I got to do for him were guitar overdubs. And then like, I ended up doing guitar overdubs for another composer next door because and things like that. And I'm actually on a, a couple of TV shows now with a, another composer who I can't say who he is, but you know he needed someone who could play guitar, and that's how I got the gig because he needed the the soundtrack to sound like a band, and that's like, you know, that's my background, even though I'm a composer. So you, you know, it doesn't have to be what you think your main main uh, focus skill is, if you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the the yep. guitar has opened more doors for me than than playing the piano. Funny enough, even though yep. the piano is my main instrument. So, so uh, Volta Music, Go Nuclear. That's one of your tracks, one of your compositions, I believe. Um, yes, it's got some big ominous synths and drums in the production, and it made me want to ask you about some of the tools that you use for creating film scores. Um, you know, I, I wrote down a couple of ones, just wondering. I get, I don't know much about the different synths and pad yeah. sense out there and everything, but a uh, serum was one I discovered recently. Massive is one I've heard about. Um, I'm probably revealing that I, that I have a dubstep wannabe DJ in me. Yes. And, uh, and Spitfire awesome. audio is another company that makes some cool string samples. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about just how do we, how do we explore and find some of the tools? Sometimes it seems overwhelming what's out there and how to figure out what to use. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's, you know, there's more and more companies doing, doing this kind of stuff. Um, uh, Spitfire is one that I, I definitely use, um, ma- mainly because uh, Hans's own sample libraries that he that he makes or made uh, were recorded in the same place. Um, oh, okay. So as if I was one of Hans's like people, then I'd have access to that. But I but I don't. But sometimes I work with them. So you know, I started buying some of the Spitfire stuff because as as a way of like trying to make sure my stuff sounded, you know. Not the same, but as close as in the same world, so that when they played back demo to the director, they weren't all of a sudden like, "Why does this one sound like absolute crap or whatever?" <laughs> um, yeah, so the Spitfire stuff's really good. Um, you know, I, I I use their strings and brass, um, and uh, synth wise, I mean, it's just because because of where I grew up in this world. I you know I use a lot of the stuff that the people there use, so they use a lot of um, like Zebra synth um, is like one mm-hmm. of the go tos. Um, for like the sort of uh, pseudo analog pulses and stuff like that, um, but I use a lot of plugins as well. Um, like I'm somebody that will uh, find a patch that I'm like, okay, that isn't right, but I'm now going to use like ten plugins to make it sound the way I want it to sound, rather than like, uh, you know, rather than going through the actual synthesis too much. Like I'll 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 manipulate the output of the synth more than the in 
interior, if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I know a lot of people who'll, who'll do the opposite and like really get a sound from within the synth, the synth itself. So I might use like a UAD Moog filter to get like some, you know, some drive on it or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, percussion wise, um, you know, a lot of the percussion on that track actually was uh, an older library called Damage, um, which anyone who knows it will be like, oh my God, it sounds like Damage. Why did you do that? Um, <laughs> but then, but same again, like with a lot of my percussion stuff, um, which I've, you know, people have complimented me on kindly. Um, it's like mixing some of the stuff I learned from record production and, uh, you know, manipulating the toms in, in that way or like using transient shaping and, you know, parallel compression and stuff like techniques that people who are composers probably don't really use or some of them might, but you know what I mean? Like, right, right. I uh, see. How, how was, to treat the sounds as if, yeah. as if you started with one thing and needed to end up with something new that had a new characteristic to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that would often be, uh, some of the first tasks I got from Matt as well would be adding sounds to something he had, and he would he would say like "f it up a bit," you know, and uh, I would I would then go off and try and figure out, and and you know after a while I knew what he meant, um, yeah. depending on what the context was. But you didn't know, you know what "f it up" means. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like "f it up," but don't "f it up," you know. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, because you know we can't be especially. I mean, especially someone like Hans couldn't just be like using some default patch, you know. And yeah. even people who aren't him, like you know, we're aspiring to, you know, yeah, try and have yeah. something be a bit special, even if it's from the same thing. And you know, and um, yeah. So you know, I, I but I had to unlearn a lot of the techniques from the record world as well um, when I first started because you know the the dynamic range of film music is obviously a lot higher than like three dB or whatever it is in a right. rock song. So. You know, the first one of the first tracks I did for Matt was this like um, uh, what they call a source cue, which is like when there's something playing on the radio in a scene or something like that. And it was like an 80s dance party track that I that they needed something like that. Um, and like as soon as he hit play, he had to like crank his like pull his fader down because he nearly went deaf because of how loud my track was. You know? <laughs> I because did that, that once too. I know you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, you know, and because they're used to basically setting a level in their room at like 85 dB with, you know, a pink noise at minus 20 or whatever. And then they leave it like that. Whereas like before I went there, I would just turn the volume of the actual output down and then have everything like hitting a limiter and being pulled down and, you know, having a mix burst and all that. I was like, no, you can't do that. You know, I mean, maybe on um, uh, like at the mix stage, they'll have a few groups and then have processing on the groups but you can't like rely on a bus compressor and it's like a whole different you know everything has to be delivered separately so yeah. i don't know how i ended up on that tangent no no but um, that's a great one because i've actually yeah. asked that before on yeah. the show and i'm starting to get the best answer from you okay. um because i did the same thing i got asked to do some film and and uh, uh i was just sort of assembling the music bits and putting it together yeah um and trying to place it and same thing i almost blew everything up because it was i didn't realize that with the same way that you try and make everything super hot for yeah. music in film, you're you, what you know what is the right level is not way up at the top; it's way down in the middle. I guess that's right. a way to explain it. Yeah. Um, and so, and the reason for that, I think I understand, is because with film, you need to be able to have room for sounds to really uh, transients to just come through loud sounds need to be able to be loud in contrast yeah. to other things. So you need exactly. much, much more dynamic range, right? Yeah. And I have another quote for you, um, which I got from Matt was that, uh, if everything's loud, nothing's loud. Right. You know? And, uh, yeah. So when you have those big, big boom hits with like an explosion and stuff like that, which, you know, it's sound effects, but you know, we might have a low synth boom or whatever at the mm -hmm. same time. And, yeah, those and also the depth. Like you want to have way more low end, like than you do on a record. Um, right. So that's something I struggle with when I do records. Like I have to change my. Um, I use this uh, program called Sonoworks, which mm -hmm. is like a, a room correction software, um, which is you know has made it possible for me to actually work in a home studio because it's amazing. Um, but I have I have a setting on for when I'm mixing records where it boosts the low end by like five dB or something because you know I'm otherwise. I'm so used to that depth of low end when you're doing film music. And if, you know, if I do that on a record, then it's like, I should have, I should basically have a sub for when I'm working on records and, and rather than uh, having all that low end in the normal 
speakers because um yeah because we're not trying to get it l- loud we're trying to get it exciting and dynamic and um and there has to be room for all the sound effects and the dialogue and all this other consideration as well so yeah no that's great and i wanted to ask you about that because i i remember uh, learning that you were using sonarworks i'm using it as well yeah. in my studio oh awesome it's, yeah it's really helped me get my mixes to have a a better low end basically it just gives me a, yeah it's Without getting super technical into it, I, I feel like it's giving me a magnifying glass for the low end when I'm in the studio. That's the way yeah. I would describe it. Yeah, and just in general, like it, you know, it makes things translate so much better um, because you know, if even if you're listening to, um, you know, good speakers, if your room is is rubbish, which most of ours are, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it cost you, it probably cost you a hundred grand to make a room, quote unquote, flat anyway. Um, so yeah, it, it it means that um you know, but before I had Sonarworks, I would mix something to make it sound the way I think it should in my head on those speakers, and then go somewhere else, and it sounds completely out of whack. And it was because of the room. So having that on means that when I go to the car, I, I don't have to do, uh, you know, I don't I don't have to to check the mix here, check the mix there anymore. You know what I mean? It's just like if I do it and it sounds good on the with the Sonarworks in my room, then it, it translates to other places and. And even with head with headphones as well. Like I first found out about it because I had to work on headphones, and uh, a guy at Bleeding Fingers Music, which is one of Hans's companies, uh, recommended. He's like, "Have you tried Sonarworks?" And I, and I, you know, and it sounded like a gimmick at first. I was like, "Oh come on, you know, I can't. How can it be that good? It's only and also because it's only around three hundred dollars." And I knew of systems that are like three grand or four grand. So I was like, "Is it really going to work?" You know, um, mm-hmm. and I and I tried it, and since then I've been like a full on. You know, I'm I'm not endorsed by them or anything. I just love it, and it's it's literally made it possible for me to work on speakers at home, which is then translated to translated to being a life changer, really. You know? Yeah. Um. So, do you want to explain how 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 do you use it? What, what, okay. It, want to explain so, how it's a plug in and all that? Yes. Yeah. So it's um you when you buy it, you get a a microphone with it that's like for measuring your room, uh, the sound. Uh, the way sound works in your room. So it's like a 15 odd minute process where the program says, put the microphone here and, and it like moves, moves you around your room. Um, and it creates like an EQ, uh, response of your room, like a graph of like the left and right. And, and like, uh, cause each, each frequency and, um, each speaker. So, you know, your right speaker might be a bit louder than your left. And so, so it like balances all that out. And then you have that on your output of your uh, interface or your sound card so that like anything you listen to will go through that and then be corrected for your room so so then when you're listening to reference mixes on on like your uh, apple music or spotify or whatever you'll hear stuff the way it it should sound rather than the way your room's making it sound right and and then so that's what i would suggest as well Not, don't just mix through it also have it on for when you're listening to references and then you can really you know, you can hear the way things are supposed to sound and then, then it's a true reference then, you know, you're mm-hmm. taking the room out of the equation and, you know, of course it's, I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's a massive, massive difference. Like, you know, and I have friends who, who work on it, who are NS10, Yamaha NS10 uh, that's, that's people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and at first they were like, well, no, I, I know my room and I love my NS10s, but then you, there's also a function on there where you can blend it. It's like a, um, a mix knob. So like a, like a friend of mine has it at 60% correction. So he still gets oh, that NS10. Yeah. So then you still got the NS10 sound or the, you know, the, the mid forward or whatever it is. Um, but it's taking the room out of the equation a bit. So yeah, um, there's, yeah. there's a, two thoughts I would add to that too. One is sure. um, something to get used to when using it though, is in order to leave itself headroom to, to be able to create EQ to compensate for your room, um, Sonarworks or Reference 4 has to drop the output just a little bit, like 6 dB is what it usually defaults to. Yeah. So it's usually a little quieter at the output than it normally is when you don't have it on. Yeah, so what I suggest doing is, um, like at least the way I learned to uh, calibrate a room volume with the pink noise, um, and there's lots of articles online about how to do that, um, so I would, I would do that through Sonarworks itself. So that way you can compensate for the volume after it, whether it's with your the output of your um, interface 
or whether it's like the speaker volumes or, you know, however. So, so like for mine, it actually goes down minus 12 or something. Um, and then I just boosted, I, I just made sure that it's 85 dB on my, uh, you know, the pink noise output. Mm-hmm. So that way, so that way it's, it's as loud as it should be after Sonoworks has done its thing, if that makes now, sense. Now, um, without getting too heavy into the 85 dB thing, yeah. what, what is your mixer experience when you've set your speakers at 85 dB and that's what you're working at for the volume at which you're listening? Um, I found it, I mean, so I find it good, but I was going to say it depends on who I'm who I'm working for and what their reference levels have been as well. Because um, there's some people I work with who, like say Matt, for example, who who have a lot, you know, they might be limiting by a couple of dB on their demos, but it's it's generally quite a lot of headroom. Um, and then there's other people I work for where it's like completely crushed. Yeah. Um, and so I'll I'll basically try and match whatever they're used to, so that when they judge my music or whatever, then they're not like, why is it so loud or so quiet or you know. Um, but for for mixing itself, yeah, I mean, I I generally have two two volumes. Um, I have a a dim switch on my on my sound card, so I'll have it at eighty five for loud. Lau- yeah, 85 for loud stuff. Um, and then uh, I have it at minus 12 of that. So I'll, I'll try and mix at the quiet level. Um, and then I'll listen, check it loud, basically, and then go back to the quiet. Um, and it depends depends on what you're mixing. But I find that if, if you mix quieter, actually, um, it sounds way better loud than it would have if, if I mixed it loud, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So you know the yeah so the low end is is like cleaner and and like punchier like the kicks really jump out right you know if you make the kicks feel punchy when it's quiet then it's going to be a lot better you know when you turn it up yeah um, I, I find that, that it, yeah. it won't sound good enough if I don't turn it up like I have to turn it up during that process too but just not yeah. not leave it up yeah exactly and, and and for me having it on a switch is really handy um because then you just having two volumes that you, you're collaborate, uh, calibrated at rather than like having this potentially dangerous thing. Because before that, I would be turning it up, turning it down, turning it up, you know, at, at a fa- on a fader or something. Um, and I think that's really risky. So it's, it's good to have it set. And, and also keeping an eye on your meters and having a few guides in mind of, um, you know, like if you're working on a record, like there's, there's probably a, po- a level that you think the kick should be and stuff like that. So yeah, the, having visual aids as well is is handy, but um, but overall, use your ears. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So another another thing I wanted to add to that is when I use it and I turn the speakers down. Yeah. Um, one of the tricks that I'm trying right now, which I'm really enjoying, is I actually mute one of my NS10s and I sum the whole mix to mono, and I turn it way down and I turn off the sub. Yeah. And I just listen to one NS10 at a low volume and do balances like that. I, oh, nice. I, I do have the Auratone or the um, Avantone you know, yeah. speaker, and that helps for doing some mid-range balances. But I really like just judging the mix off one speaker at, at a low volume. And I've been turning Reference 4 off for that because I because part of my take on it is at that low, low volume, it's not really activating the modes of the room. Right. So maybe I don't need it. For that, so maybe that's just one more reference. But these are all cool, cool insights for for using that, man. Yeah, I'll, I mean, it's harder for for film music to do mono um, for me because the orchestra is such a wide stereo image that, like, uh, you know, the balance is. I don't, I don't know. I just it, it just sounds so weird when it's just in mono and the you know the the violins and the basses are coming from the same place and stuff yeah, like that. Like, yeah. uh, you know, so a lot of the balance I'll I'll do is with panning, like so. If I have a piano in with the orchestra, I'll I'll have the piano at player's perspective so that the bass of the piano is on the left and the bass of the orchestra is on the right and stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I I I think if I if I do more record stuff, I'd like to get um like an Auratone or uh, a sub and some NS10s. But right now I use um I've used for a while KRK uh, V8s. Oh, cool. Um, which are kind of like the you know second level. You know, they're not the top level of their speaker, but they're like the sort of, you know. Is the V8 the three drivers or, or two drivers? It's two. It's just two, but it's an eight inch. I, I feel like, at least for me, um, with film music, you need at least an eight inch driver, I think, because of yeah. the you know, 
for the like big hits and stuff like that. So I'm staring um, at a pair of the KRK Rocket 4s in front of me too. Oh, because, cool. Yeah, I've got the the 5s for my rear speakers actually. So yeah, they're, they're great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say about that? Uh, I guess we'll just... Oh yeah, I was going to let you know, Rockstars, that I actually did create a video on YouTube of how to install Reference 4 and what that process is like with the mic and everything. So I'll include a link to that in the show notes. Oh, nice. And uh, and if it's not there when you listen to this podcast, go kick my ass and make me put that link in there. No, I'll remember to do it this time. <laughs> and there's there's actually a free trial of it as well. So you can, um, I mean, obviously, if you don't have the mic, maybe you have a friend that has the mic or or just try it on your headphones, you know, because then you can really hit, like you'll hear straight, like the way I tested it and the way it was shown to me, and I don't know if you found the same, Lidge, but... um. You know, put it, put it on, put put the plug-in on, and then play some of your favorite records through it. And and there's a bypass button on the plug-in, and you go, you know, turn that on, turn it off, and you'll be like, you'll instantly be like, uh, yeah, I need this. You know, yeah. it's, it's really, it's quite mind blowing. Yeah. Well, for me, the first aha moment was a rough mix that I had done of some stuff I did with my band. That when I took it to the car, I knew that the bass and the kick were like way out of whack, and I was just like, yeah. But in the studio. It still it didn't bother me, you know. I guess that's the way to put it. Um, the excitement was there. It was it was fun to turn it up in the studio, and then yeah. when I put on Reference Four and I engaged it, it like immediately became obvious to me that the kick and the bass were out of whack. And that's what I mean about the magnifying glass on it. It was like, without getting too, you know, um, scientific about it, it was just mm-hmm. that simple. I just turned it on. I was like, oh, this is obvious now. I would have completely made made a different balance. Well, that's it. And and so if you had that on, when you have that on from the beginning, then you're saving yourself so much time as well, you know, yeah. because you're not, you're, you're making the, you're making an informed decision on every decision you make as yeah. you mix. Yeah. That's you a know? key thing for mixing. Yeah, isn't it? yeah exactly. Exactly. Because it's like, you know, other, I mean, you know, it's like doing something with the wrong glasses on or something, you know, it yeah. really, um, it's going to save you time. And plus then what you do finish with will work everywhere and people will say that sounds great you know yeah i this it takes me way back to an interview i did with fab dupont and, and one of oh, his yeah. his comments on mixing was just as simple as like he's like you have to hear it if you can't hear the low end you can't do anything about it yeah you know um or if you can't hear what you're trying to get right in that moment at least because we're not always trying to get the low end right sometimes it's mid-range and balance and stuff yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, you, other, you might as well just mute the speakers and just do it by <laughs> by vision. Then go you know. get a real job, <laughs> right? Oh no, I didn't mean that. I'm like, just give up now. No, I just mean like if you can't, you know, if you're if you're what you're hearing is completely uh, messed up, then yeah, it's not. I mean, it sounds so obvious, but you know, Ooh. people. I'm sure they'll know. You'll know what we mean when you when you try this plugin anyway. Yeah, it does raise a fascinating question about whether or not you actually could. Is there any? Indicator that you could use to mute the speakers and still mix a song. Right, that would be fascinating. I like I some, if, some visual level thing where you just just check your levels. Yeah, or, or um, maybe using something like Isotope Neutron and uh, <laughs> using their their track assistant on everything, and yeah. then seeing what it sounds like afterwards. <laughs> I, I haven't tried that yet, but I've I've oh. watched a lot, videos of people using it and stuff. It's pretty fascinating. We're entering yeah. a whole new age of yeah. music making. With all the AI stuff and, you know, some of it's pretty crazy, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Well, so let me jump to a new question. Um, sure. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, Handy Candy was a track that you did. It's got great sort of pumping synth pad in the mix and it's uh, it's clearly kind of a dance track vibe. Yeah. Um, and I, it makes me want to ask a few questions. So sure. Um, tell a story about making that. How do you get drums to sound exciting in a mix, especially when you're dealing with, I can't, I, I need to make them exciting, but I can't make them too loud. And then um, how do you explain the pumping effect that you got for that? Cool. So um, I have to do a quick disclaimer at the beginning of this that I I mixed, I didn't do the final mix of this track. Basically. I was actually so, just getting coffee for this track, but y- yeah, <laughs> it was no, really I, good coffee. <laughs> yeah. So I I did I did mix what I what I sent, um, and I you know, but um, but and I I you know, I'd like to think there's not much difference between my mix and their mix, but there there probably is. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of it was referencing things, to be honest. So mm-hmm. I. You know, I I used to do dance music when I was younger, and I hadn't done it for a while, and the sounds changed quite a lot. So I I listened to a lot of more current because because that's what the um 
the composers actually Matt Matt Martin and Mike Hyam were co-composing, and and they asked me to to do this track for them, and then mm-hmm. using using some of their uh, musical themes, and then uh, they they finished it and and they shaped it to the scene themselves. So I I basically wrote like an eight or ten minute track, um, and then they cut it up and and used it the way they wanted. Cool. Um, which is which is why if you listen to it, you might be like, well, that's weird. Like why that thing changes after that many bars instead of eight bars or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, so I started off with the kick drum and I was like, cause that's so important in, in a house. I mean, it's basically like a house track. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I listened to a lot of like uh, Swedish house mafia and stuff like that. I and, dig it. You know, and, and layered up the kick like until I, I used the, I think I used um, an SSL E channel from waves actually to get some of that nice top end on things. Yeah. Um, and uh, the pumping effect. So this this goes back to the conversations in the car park again. So I mean, obviously, there's the you know people can side chain. Uh, you know, um, there's a thing called you know, side chaining compression, which, mm-hmm. which I'm sure you're aware of. But and, yeah, and but you can feel free to like. re-explain it to us. Yeah. So basically, where you might have, uh, if you want the synth to pump, for example, um, to get that uh, 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 this kind of thing. Um, you put a compressor on on the synth and then do a send from your kick drum to that compressor. And so whenever the kick, so the actual synth part is probably just me holding the chord forever. And then when the kick hits, it pulls the compressor down uh, on the synth. So that's why you get them like pumping each other. But then because it's film music and I had to deliver everything separately, um, you know, there are ways of getting the kick to still pump the synth and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you know, way, it, it, it's like a, a head, it can screw with your head a bit, you know, or at least it did to me then, which was, I think it was 2014 or 2015 or something. So I was chatting about this to a guy in the car park, you know, who's a Swedish uh, composer uh, and um, at, at Bleeding Fingers, Christian. And I was just telling him about what I was up to, like, like you do when you catch up with someone. And he was like, oh, there's actually a plugin um, by a DJ called Kickstarter which um, emulates that pumping. And you can automate it as well. So then I, I, I think it was like $15 or something for this plugin. So, um, so I put that plugin on all these things and it has like uh, different shapes of the pumping and it has uh, different times. You can have it on eighth notes or quarter notes or whatever you want. And plus you can blend it in. So I, I use that as an effect as well. So I'd have like moments where the pumping was less and then like have it automated to crank up and stuff like that. That's um, cool. That's cool. Yeah, I, so I had really learned fun. about another one. I think it's called Volume Shaper. Is another a similar yeah. idea, but it's it, just keep keep going because explaining how something like that works instead of the side chain, I think, is really insightful for us. Yeah. So I mean, it's kind of you know it's sort of cheating, I guess, but because um, it's and it's like a volume. I guess it is a volume shaper, um, but it meant that I could deliver all of these tracks separately, and they'd still have the pumping the way it was right. and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and then what? So, so a lot of those synths were um, zebra again, and um, I and I'm sure I used some distortion on them and some Moog filters. There was so much automation on that track, like it was it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, but that's just how I how I work with that kind of stuff, you know. Now, do you um, do try and commit the automation to deliver it to somebody else for mix, and how do you make the decision between? This is something that I should commit to the sound before handing it off, and this is something that is part of the mix process that, that they should do. Yeah, so for at least in my experience, for film music, we deliver everything. Um, so they're just going to get audio files. L- like they might have reverb returns, and but that'll be it. Like so, I deliver everything uh, as as it was when it left my room as a as a committed audio file. So you know all that automation and how everything sounds and. You know, if there's delays inserted and stuff like that, all of that is there. And then if, if the mixer requires something dry, then I can send it to them dry. But um, I'll usually send the effects uh, as separate audio files. Um, so it's not the same as like when you do a record mix and somebody might have the same DAW as you and therefore open your session and be able to mess with everything. Um, it's more like they're starting, they're, they're taking, it's kind of like a relay, you know, they're taking over from where you left off rather than like starting from the beginning or being able to. You know, and and where I left it off is what was approved, basically, or at least by the composers, and then the, and then further down the line. 
Yeah, um, this isn't I mean? this isn't the example where you go, yeah, guys, I sent you um, I sent you a whole bunch of MIDI tracks, and I figured you'd really want to like explore some of the different sound options for these. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and that's what they brought me in for as well because of my aesthetic on on this kind of stuff, you know. And yeah. um, so yeah, and and it took a long time, you know. And it's probably I probably spent like I don't know a week or more on it. So yeah. at least a, f- a long time in terms of film music. So um, you know, I did a lot of that. Uh, research and development, and then they took it from there. And I'm sure the mixer made it sound better and and you know more balanced and and so on. But um, but yeah, I'd like to think what I what I'd done sounded all right. <laughs> yeah, so so that, that's interesting. You you say a, a long time, at least as far as film music. So yeah, to talk a little bit about the time frame for creating film music. What does that mean? I mean, is there what's what's a is there such thing as a very quick composition turnaround? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, like everything, it depends on the the schedule of the project and the budget and so on. But um, I mean, typically people are expected to do at least a minute a, a day, but sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four minutes a day. You know, some TV stuff, it's like they have, if you're on an episodic TV show, um, you might have like four days total to do the whole score, if that, you know, wow. and it could be like half an hour or, you know. So that's why a lot of people will have to have people like, come and help and and so on because it's and i've done i've done a few commercials um and uh i put every time i've done one i'm like i'm never doing this again because the turnaround on those is is usually like you might get an email saying you have till like 1 p.m the next day to do this whole thing um and then there's like rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds of notes um and then they're like okay you're down to the last two and then it's like okay you've won you know you're gonna get 10 grand and then you find out they use something else anyway, and so you get no money. And it's like, it's, you know, or you might get like a few hundred dollars for a demo fee. But it's like the stress, the stress to uh, income uh, ratio for me is like I just, you know, um, not anymore for me. But um, but some people are, you know do that. But yeah, but with film, um, yeah, I mean, you usually have about a, a day to do a minute. But but that but it doesn't matter to them whether it's a minute of a piano and a pad or a minute of full on action music you know so um, they still want it delivered yeah yeah so you know and or it might be like every week you have to send them so much so you might have some days where you do like 40 seconds and other days that you do two minutes and it's a, you know it, it, it very much depends but i usually tell my clients that i'm definitely not the fastest person that they'll hire but um at the same time i'm definitely probably one of the more meticulous people and what they do get from me knock on wood Usually they'll only have a couple of tweaks for me. Like as long as I've gone down the right initial direction, it'll mm-hmm. usually be like, "Oh, can you mute that sound at that point, a part of the thing?" Or can you like, you know, um, that one guitar sound I don't like, um, but the other two are great. You know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Whereas there's, there's other people I know that will do like four or five minutes a day, but then it's like several days worth of rewrites and stuff. You know what I mean? So. Well, I'd like to think that what I deliver is preferable than having loads of rounds of notes, even if they're only getting, you know, less yeah, music out of me per day. I don't think anybody really enjoys notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Either writing them or receiving them. Right, exactly, because it takes their time as way away from when they need to be writing too, doesn't it? So yeah, so so that makes me think that you're talking about, you know, again, virtual instruments. Um, yes, you're probably yeah. not breaking out microphones, not when you when you're at that pace. Um, and um, it, it also makes me wonder about the opportunity because I, I do hear a lot of people say things like, um, you know, like, oh, if if so and so or such and such would just give me a chance, I could show them. And then I think about your world, and I'm like, there's no way you're going from like a um, a home studio where you just take your sweet time about things to to somebody giving you a chance in that same respect. It's like you have to put yourself in the position to already be able to deliver things by one o'clock yeah. before somebody's even going to consider yeah. putting that kind of responsibility in your hands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the, the first question, I mean, I, I'll do um, guitar overdubs and stuff like that. Like, you know, I it'll have to be a real rush if I'm going to use MIDI guitar. Um, but apart from that, um, yeah, it is all samples. and um, But yeah, I mean... I, I'm lucky that I had that long, I mean, a, a, almost 10 years. Well, I guess I, I went freelance in 2014. So it was a good like four years of plus like what I learned from before doing film music to get my skills up. And then the initial chances that you get are things like play guitar on this or add percussion to this. And then eventually, 
you get to the point where somebody knows they can call you and ask you for something like fully done in not much time. Um, but it's but it's a relationship thing, you know, like every like so much, you know, it's uh, it's these relationships that that I've started and years and years ago, and and it's like a buildup of trust as far as like the the intensity of what they require from me starting off something small and then gradually building it up. But yeah, it would be really hard to just come in and, and like, you know, be able to do something really quick if you've never done it before and, and you're not, you don't know what the aesthetic is supposed to be and stuff like that. So talk to you us know? a little bit about um, what it means to use a template in what you do. How important is that as part of the speed of your process and um, what comments would you like oh, to yeah. share about that? Yeah, I mean, that's something I learned from, Matt as well like before uh, having a template was hugely important um because uh before that I would just be like oh I need a bass sound and then like spend 20 minutes finding a bass and you know and and I still do that but yeah as far as the the overall sound goes like the the overall orchestra like I probably have I don't know seven eight hundred tracks midi tracks like just ready to go and then if I need something else I load that in um, but it is super important because then you can just scroll to a track, play it in, and that's it, and move on and move on and move on, you know. But but then I know some people might be saying, oh, well, then everything's going to sound the same because it's a template. But it's not. It's not really. I mean, you can still change the reverb. You can still uh, you can still manipulate the output of something and put a different plugin on it or something like that yeah, if you need yeah. to. You know, I'm lucky that I have everything within Cubase and like I have a really uh, everything split out pretty wide in my template. So if I want to like make the violins a bit brighter, I, it's just like one track I can go to and add some top end to it and stuff like that. Um, but no, the template's really important. Um, and it's and getting to know your own template and making making it make sense for you. And I have like every um, every section has different colors that I know. You know, like uh, I'm sure everyone does as well. So you know where to find things and stuff like that. Because um, mm-hmm. that's another thing as well. Like a lot of a lot of my initial projects, there'd be somebody breathing down my neck, literally like standing in my room next to me. Uh, even sometimes on on other, on like when I was Matt's assistant, and if Matt was out of the country and somebody needed something to be changed, and you know they'd be like, uh, "Okay, can you go here and do this and change that?" And you have to be able to to find stuff really fast, you know. Um, so yeah, having a template you're familiar with, but then also being able to load in other sounds. But then you know, there's other people that that do that don't do that, you know. Um, but uh, I I found it to, to be really helpful to to be able to get things going fast and even if even if you end up changing the the actual uh, characteristics of a sound as long as you know that you have your general foundational instruments ready to go all the time that's really helpful. Yeah, maybe an analogy for the rock band stuff is like you don't need to sit down to record a guitar part and you know put yourself in the music store where you're like, oh, which guitar should I pick off the wall? You could still start with a guitar that that works often for you and you're going to be yeah. able to play it a whole variety of different ways and with a few tweaks on the pedals, you know, you can come up with a completely different sound. So it's just having your instrument. It's almost yeah. like you're saying you're, you, the template is you're making sure your instrument is tuned and ready to go. Right, exactly. And have, you know, yeah, exactly. And having things plugged in. Like I have my mics and guitars already plugged in basically all the time and stuff like that. And yeah, so that's a really good analogy. Or you might have a, a mixed template with your like, you know, effects bus is always ready and you, or you might have a few inserts that are there that are disabled, but just so it's quicker so that you can quickly turn things on and off rather than, you know, having to hunt things down. And so, yeah, it's just having, having your, uh, your painting palette ready to go. Nice. Your colors. You know I mean? Your colors. Yeah. <laughs> Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. 
Um, Cubase. Talk to us yep. a little bit about some of the things that you really like about Cubase and talk to us about learning Pro Tools. And, and is Pro Tools something that you use often now or is it something, you know, yeah. you, you talked about learning it years ago? Yeah, so Pro Tools, I, I, I use it all the time. Um, I have it on all the time. Um, but I use it for, for uh, like having my, my video. It's like my video host. Um, and I use it for music editing. Uh, and ha- so like when you when you have a, a few people working on a film and everyone uploads their their uh, mixes uh, like you know the the two mix or whatever you'd call it, the stereo mix of something and then you pull that all into Pro Tools so you can have like the whole all the music in the right place and that kind of stuff that's what I use it for. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've never done a mix on Pro Tools. I've, I mean I've done like a uh, you know I've written written one fader on it and you know to go f- with a dialogue track but. Um, and I know, I, I think I know how I would mix, but I've, I, I work in Cubase. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's the first sequencer that I ever, ever used. Um, so I know I'm biased because it, it, it makes sense to me just because I've been using that product since I was like 12 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, with, with a little, uh, I did use Nuendo for a while, which is basically the same thing. Um, but the pro, the sort of post production version, but nowadays Cubase has, almost all the features from new endo anyway so um yeah and i you it's great for composing um it's great for producing like there's a lot of songwriters that use it as well um there's some features that are like um like with a midi programming for example um you can have and this is probably going to be above people's heads unless they they do composing but like say for example if you're if you're recording in a violin part and you have uh, the vibrato, like you, you know, on the guitar, um, and there's all these other sort of uh, parameters that you can change with MIDI controllers. Mm-hmm. And in Cubase, in Cubase, you can see all of that at the same time, and and you can have and you can customize Cubase so much so you can have whatever colors you want or whatever. But also key commands are all customizable. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I've got all mine from working with Matt, and I and you can bring that file with like if I have to work in someone's room that has different key commands, I can just load my my key command file, and then I can work in their room as if it was mine, which is really handy. What's your easy way to make sure that you know exactly where to find that key command file so that you just grab it and load it right into you? Like uh, carry uh, a little USB stick on your keychain or something like that? Yeah, I, I would have it on a on a USB stick, but I also have a little Dropbox folder if I if I can get access to the internet wherever I am as well. Right. With like with things like that, like my my key commands and um, yeah, and and if there's something that isn't a key command, you can make a macro within Cubase and things like that, which is really handy. Um, so all of those things, um, and then uh, some of the other stuff that's customized for for Hans Hans Zimmer as well that I learned from them. And nice, you know, what, I mean, what is a macro? A macro is like an automated, like step by step thing. So uh, which you can program into the computer so like say for example if you want something to um turn on uh something and then do something and then do something else. i'm, I'm not really can't think of a good example that's well, easy just to understand, something but. that's a pain in your butt if you got to do yeah. it a bunch of times yeah exactly if there's some like multiple step process you 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 uh put that into your key command thing as and save it as a macro and then you what that and then you assign a key to it. So say if the key is K, then every time I hit K, it's going to delete ten bars and then you know solo the drums or something. You know yeah, you can do so cool. pretty much stuff like that. You know, yeah. No, it's massive, massively helpful. And also folder tracks. Um, so I, if I need to solo the orchestra or mute the orchestra, stuff like that. Like sometimes, like when I when I saw uh, when Henry Jackman would um, come and listen to things and he'd be like, okay, solo the strings, mute the strings, because he's really into the production as well and he wants to hear like what's... Because sometimes you might not necessarily hear all that's underneath the orchestra when it's all playing. So he he really wants to hear that and he wants to hear this. And yeah, it's just really quick to be able to solo or mute certain things, mm-hmm. you know, which I don't know how I would do in Pro Tools. I guess you'd have to have groups and... The solo groups, yeah, I think. Solo be, groups, you know. I don't actually so, use those very often, but yeah. I think that's how you would do it. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I mean, and like, there's, there's also um, apparently it sounds like the timing is 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 tighter than other DAWs. I don't know if that's true, but interesting. Um, but you can oh, MIDI uh, timing. 
Yeah, because there's like every every MIDI every library uh, sound library has its own like issues with latency of the samples, and so every track I have, you can put a, a pre delay, so it'll it'll compensate for whatever that is, like twenty milliseconds or whatever, and things like that. And it's mm-hmm. just really easy to do stuff like that. Um, um, there's another yeah. thing I remember learning about it is that the you have. Um, Effects you can put on the master fader, and you have effects you can put post master fader as well. So I'm guessing maybe that's where you put sonar works, for example. Um, I actually have so yeah, you could do it there, or there's um, a thing called control room, which is within Cubase, which is kind of like a virtual um, like volume knob and output chain. Ah, okay. So you can have it on that, and then it won't pr- it won't like bounce your audio through it. Oh, that's, that's handy. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you you know obviously when you when you and, and I think the plugin will alert you if it's still on, but if if you have it on your master bus, you you need to turn it off before you you bounce your audio. Um, yeah. Of, yeah. But um, yeah, I actually have Sonarworks set up in Pro Tools because I I monitor everything through Pro Tools, um, just so that because that's where all the other audio is and my dialogue and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. In order for me yeah. to not have to turn Sonarworks off. I create like a double output, so I might be listening to output one and two, but when I bounce, I might just bounce three and four, and it's right, you know, yeah. routed from a from an AUGS mix bus before the master fader. Yeah, and and uh, when you're talking about pre and post uh, fader in Cubase now, you you have I think sixteen inserts per track, and you can move. There's like a little line that you can move up and down that determines whether something's pre or post. So you can decide like which plugins are post fader. And you could have all of them post fader or some of them and stuff like that, which is oh super interesting. Cool. Yeah, so you can like mimic driving. Like if you want to ride a vocal into a compressor, instead of having that on a separate track, you could have it on the same track but post fader and things like that, which is really handy too. Cool. You know? All yeah. right. Well, um, let's jump into some of our outro questions before we close right. out here. Um, yeah. When you started out in recording, what was holding you back? Yeah, I I, I thought about that question and I I. I don't really know what the answer is, to be honest, because I, I mean, I was very lucky that, you know, I had really supportive parents and like schools and, um, you know, I, I just, I can't remember ever feeling like I wasn't uh, aspiring to do this. Do you know what nice. I mean? So, yep. so like, even if I only had like a very minimal setup, um, you know, which I think was actually a good thing, to be honest, like I started off on a, on an eight track cassette recorder. Um, nice. You know, and I had to record everything in from Cubase onto stereo track, and yeah. You know, um, but I think that was good to learn on something that was so basic, and and um, that skill of making the most out of what you have actually helped me set up my rig right now. Like for example, I have um, when I said I've run everything through Pro Tools, and Pro Tools and Cubase are both on the same computer, sharing a sound card, which like. Everyone I've told to is like, "What does that work?" And I was like, "Yeah." And, and it's like, "Well, why?" Did, the reason I I have that setup is because I didn't have the money to buy another computer for the other thing, you know. And I just tried it, and it worked. So that kind of like resourcefulness has lived with me of like trying to make things work, even if they, you know, in theory shouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you talk about using an eight track cassette and bouncing Cubase to it, it's a reminder that when you started using Cubase, was it still just a MIDI? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I started in, I think it would have been 1992-ish, maybe 93. So I think it was Q, It was on a PC. Um, I think I had 16 tracks of MIDI available, but my keyboard only was only eight tracks, multi-timbral. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I had like eight tracks max, um, and it was all running live from my keyboard. And yeah, I think, I think the audio one, at least the first time I'd ever used it, was probably in like the early 2000s or something like that, or yeah. late, late 90s. Well, you made another comment earlier too. You talked about your Korg M1 keyboard and yes, having exactly. the, little, the little screen on it. And it, it made me realize and remember that there's a generation of music makers now that won't necessarily, I was trying to think of examples, but I guess generally speaking, they won't necessarily know what it's like to be creating music from these little teeny digital screens. Yeah, <laughs> Everything, they don't know the pain. Yeah, well, just yeah. everything is, you know, with computer interfaces now, mm-hmm. you know, or touchscreen iPads, you're just, you just assume that there's some sort of touchable thing and you can see all the parameters in front of you and stuff. And it wasn't always like that. So it's, it's nice to have access to all those things now, though, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But fun, funny enough as well, um, 
Yeah, because you used to have to do the math of like, okay, if I'm going to have this pattern twice for the verse, and then I have to do this many bars and blah blah. Um, but I heard that, um, and I, I, I think I'm right in saying this. I think Pharrell actually used a, a similar sequencer on the Korg O1, and apparently he still does a lot of his programming uh, with that. Or like, I think he he might have had somebody build him a, a software version of the O1 sequencer. Nice, something like that. So even though you've got all these tools now, but apparently that's how he he still works. I, I don't know if that's true, but I heard that from somebody that worked at the studio and thought that was really cool, you know? Yeah, well, I can believe that that might be true because I've learned that it's far more valuable to have a way that works for you than to have yeah. the, the latest way. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. You know, that's really true. And um, having a way and, and making something sound good, it doesn't matter how you got there really as long as it sounds good, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I remember my roommate years ago, and, I, and we're kind of digressing here, but... Yeah. He had the Ensonic EQ16 or, or what's it called? Shoot, I forget the the sequencer, yeah. keyboard and sampler. I'm um, one of the first ones, 16 plus, I think it was. And, yeah, and he would just fly on that, Matt. Shout wow. out to you, Matt Mahaffey. Um, he would fly and just hit all these buttons and stuff, and it was like, and I I was really struck by that, and it and that stayed with me because it's that reminder that like the ability to Stay in the creative mindset and move fast. Yeah, is your the, it's the most valuable thing you got. Yeah, and and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about templates. It's the same kind of thing. It's like being able to fly through that instead of getting held up by loading things. And you know, even especially if it's things that you're going to load for everything, then you might as well just have it all set up. And even if your computer can't hack it, like nowadays you can deactivate tracks. So a lot of people do that as well, where they'll have. You know the seven hundred odd tracks, but they they just activate whichever one they need and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, uh, let me jump to the next question. Sure. So, some of the best advice you remember receiving. Some of the best advice, um, I would say, um, one of them is what well, I said it earlier, like using your ears, um, and another one is uh, doesn't like the thing I said earlier about it doesn't matter how you got there as long as it sounds good because mm-hmm. sometimes I would be. Um, like kind of embarrassed about like oh I use this uh, you know Tony Maserati plugin or whatever and uh, you know I feel like sorry, I'm Tony <laughs> sorry no 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 sorry nothing about Tony but what I mean is I if I use one of those plugins that's like the Greg Wells or any of those like um, you know uh, artist series plugins yeah, yeah. which which are like doing EQ and compression and reverb and all yep. that in one thing which which a lot of them I use and I think they sound brilliant um, you know the I was like, am I cheating? You know, should I be setting up this? Should I get an LA two A going into a blah blah? And then uh, you know, this engineer was like, doesn't matter. Does it sound good? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, great. And I was yeah, like, that, that just sort of really like it was such a relief to me because I felt like I was this like joker, you know, being among all these people that are using really pro stuff. And it's, again, nothing. I'm not trying to slag off their stuff at all. No, no, um, no, no. I'm just but, joking. But, you around, know, but... I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, "Am I cheating by using this?" And it's like, doesn't matter. Like nobody's listening to Katy Perry and going, "Oh, if they use the, you know, this plugin, then they don't know what they're doing." You know, it just right, sounds exactly. amazing, and that's you know, that's it. So, um, yeah, there's the famous quote about like nobody, um, what is it? Nobody listens to the song on the radio and and hums the sound of the console. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and and the performance as well. Like how how important it is to to make sure the people you're working with are having a good time and feel comfortable. And like, that's the most important thing is that their performance comes through. And, you know, obviously it's ideal if you can get a good recording and, you know, not have to fix it in the mix per se, but like, it's more important that, that they're happy and they feel good. And, and the, and the, you know, the, the music that comes out of them is, is, is exciting and true to them. And then, you know, rather than being like, you know, stressing them out with like, oh, let me just try this compressor and let me try this. And then, you know, by the time you've got your amazing vocal chain set up, they're all like fed up and, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? So, I've, yeah. I've been there and done that. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, it's all learning from mistakes as well and, and like uh, getting up again and just keep keep going and never give up, you know, same, <laughs> same message as from earlier. So unless I change my mix template between now and when this uh, when I mix this episode, uh, you're all going to be hearing my voice and your voice through the CLA vocal plugin. So there you oh, go. Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. It's, it's more there than one knob, but it's it, but it's only a couple. It's only no. A few. I love that. I love that, and I actually love the um, 
the because I have been doing a, some rock stuff recently, and um, this Australian band uh, called Satellite Sky that are here in LA, and uh, shout out to them. And um, you know, I was trying different things on my mix bus. I was trying like the you know the usual SSL uh, thing or um, the town townhouse compressor, um, Fairchild. Like I was trying a bunch of different things, um, the Neve, and then and I actually settled on the CLA one, the mix down, which I've. You know, I don't know why, but I often go back to that, and I think it sounds brilliant. And it's only like thirty nine dollars or something, but you know, yeah, so, I, yeah, I have that one, and I need to use it more. I, I occasionally I stumble on it. I'm like, that sounds great. And same thing, yeah. I, I do that self doubt thing for a moment. Yeah, I, stop doing that, Lidge. Stop doing that. So, yeah, it's just like toggle between them, and it's like, yeah, that sounds better. I like the, yeah. you know. Yep, so. switching between is great. Um, yep. uh, so maybe that's it, the answer to this next question, but um, do you want to share another recording tip hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars can use on their next session this afternoon? Ooh, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, toggling things is good. You know, like, uh, so whenever you put on a plug-in, uh, turn it off and on and and level, like try and get the, the volume to be the same so you're not getting tricked by like it getting louder and mm-hmm. therefore sounding better. And uh, just be, I mean, I'm really guilty of this. You know, I, I definitely have a bit of gear acquisition syndrome or whatever. You know, whenever I get a new plugin, it's, that's what I use on everything. Or if, if, even if it's not working, I'm like reluctant to, to not use it because it's new and it looks purple or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like the MC77. Yeah. Um, it's like an 1176, but one better. Um, but yeah, just like being, just always going back to what sounds better on with this on or with this off and then just keep, keep moving and, um, yeah, have have fun. I, I also really enjoyed. Um, there's a mix with the masters video of um, of this engineer that sadly passed away uh, quite recently. He did the Phoenix um, Phoenix record. Oh wow! Um, and he, uh, he, oh my god, I can't believe I've, his name is escaping my mind. Um, Philippe Philippe Zadar. There you go. His name, and uh, it's free actually. Um, it's one of the, they actually released it for free because of his death. And um, the, he he has so much fun while he's mixing, and he's like breaking rules left, right, and center. And it was so liberating to watch. Like he's like, oh, that's a, a vocal, but it's coming up the kick channel. But who cares? It sounds good, you know. Yeah, I love that kind that. of stuff. I mean, it must be a nightmare for his assistant. It must have been a nightmare. But um, but he would like start a mix without resetting the console and just like. On a, he's on an outboard SSL, but there's so much like, um, I, I, yeah, just watching videos of different people mixing and learning that everyone has their own way of doing it. And that kind of validated to me that maybe my way is all right. You know, it's not like I have to suddenly learn how to mix like that, that professional guy or whatever. You know, there's, uh, there's stuff you can, we can all take from different people and find a way that makes sense to you and, and the kind of work you're doing. So being open to all those different ideas. All right, very cool. Well, let yeah. me let me jump to a closing question here um, because we've been going a good long stretch. Yeah, um, this one's hypothetical. We're going to take the way back studio machine, do 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 do, and go back in time, and you're going to find young Jason and say, "Listen, dude, um, don't quit the piano." You know, <laughs> no, uh, you go back and you find yourself, and and you say, "I want to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself." one day, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Um, I would probably say to take care of your, take care of your health, like as a priority. Um, because like, like so many people, you know, I've probably gained a lot of weight since I started this job. And like mm. only in the last maybe two or three years, I'm like going to the gym a couple of times a week. Um, but for a long time, it was like, you know, I didn't feel like I, I could really escape and, and take care of myself. But, but you, you know, I think that really helped. Like now I feel, I mean, even though I'm 10 years older than then, I feel so much more energy. And because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not even drinking caffeine. Uh, I have like my decaf espressos, but you know, just, just taking care of your health is so important because it, it can be really a stressful job. And, and if you, if you, at least for me, like when, when you exercise regularly, um, you know, you won't feel that stress as much and, and you'll be able to stay, stay calm and, and then do better. Like I do so much better work when I'm relaxed and feeling good. Like, I, any, yeah. you know what I mean? like yeah. I, I'll, I'll work faster in that state of mind than I will if I'm like, oh my God, I have to do this. Then I'll, uh, you know, so I'd say that would be important just to like uh, take care of your health. Because I mean, so many of us music and music working people 
like so many of them die young, you know, they or they're like, you know, going to die young. And it's just like because of all the sitting around the studio and not not exercising and, you know, yeah, that, that kind that, of that's sedentary. What was, that's yeah. what I was going to ask. Um, two, two questions. One is uh, what what are the challenges of studio that make us unhealthy? And two, um, mm. are there any tips that you have for how to balance that with healthy? But I mean, obviously, you still have to do all this insane studio time. Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, for me, it's been a big help to have. I've got a couple of dogs, and that's been a massive help because um, you know they make me go out for a walk a few times a day, um, and it's also been really social because you end up meeting people and on your street and and at the studio. Actually, a lot of us had dogs, and that was really really cool to get to know each other's dogs and nice. people. And um, but also, uh, what was I going to say? Um, uh, hours wise, you know. When I was an assistant, I had to work around other people's hours. But now that I'm independent, and I highly recommend just having trying to have set hours, especially if you work from home and or if you live alone, and you could in the, well, I could in theory be up all night and day if I wanted to. But you know, I feel so much better sticking because I said earlier, my wife, my wife's a nurse. Um, she's a nurse practitioner actually now, so she does like eight eight in the morning till eight p.m. or something like that. So just trying to stick to a regular schedule and you know I, unless i absolutely have to now i'll i'll usually stop working around um like after about 12 hours or something like that um, nice. and uh you know i've probably done a couple i still i still end up doing the odd all nighter but it's usually because somebody requests something at at 8 p.m. that they need done by 8 a.m. um but apart from that now i'm just like you know, and it's hard sometimes to say no to people or to put your foot down. But it's like, you know, I, I'm I'm not prepared to go back to that place I was in where there were times when I was having like panic attacks in the car, like because it's just because of all the the caffeine and the like super long hours. You know, it's just like it's got to the point now where I'd rather not work and not have to do that again. If that mm -hmm. makes sense, mm -hmm. I know that's a luxury at the at this point. I mean, I'm not like, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm not a millionaire or anything, but um. You know, it's. Uh, I know you can't always say no to, to gigs, but just trying to prioritize your health a little bit more than you than you feel like you you're able to, if that makes sense. You know, because you, have you seen anybody work for somebody else those long, long hours and being available all the time in the studio and balance it out with health, or have you? Do, a, do you have any ideas very, for that yourself? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think what what's happened at least. What I've seen is that as as the people they're working for are getting older and like prioritizing their family time and stuff like that, and also as the uh, so then they're they're not in the studio as much, and also the studio equipment now, um, at least like the computers are cheaper, so a lot of people can have duplicate setups for their assistants. So like where, whereas when I worked for Matt, he just had the one setup. And I'd have to work on it when he wasn't there, which meant like sometimes coming in at two in the morning and working right. till, you know, and, and stuff stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so some of it is 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 that like, um, and then some some people just go right. I'm going for a run at lunchtime, and I've seen I've seen somebody do that, and like just because there's a lot of time when you're an, at least a composer assistant where you are sitting around and you you know for hours sometimes waiting to do the next thing in their room. So you in theory you could go off for a run or something like that. And, yeah. You know, or if they had, I mean, it'd be amazing to have a studio that had a gym at it or something, or yeah, even just a, point, a couple man. of treadmills, you know. Ooh, good uh, point. I like that. Yeah. Because I, I was hoping they'd do that. At Han I mean, Hans's place has has a shower, which is like amazing as well, because that would be something we'd all do at three in the morning to keep ourselves going, <laughs> go and have a shower. Maybe not at the same, not at the same time, I may add. Um, but yeah, if the studio could have a gym or, or you know, something like that. Um, it doesn't have to be much, like just just so you're not just sitting there, or or like getting a desk that can go up and that, like I've got a desk that I can stand at, it's just like a cheap IKEA desk. Um, so sometimes I'm standing rather than sitting, like when I'm prepping my sessions or something like that. Yeah, I've you seen know? I've seen artists bring a treadmill into the studio before and stuff. Yeah, because there's a lot of sitting around. Well, awesome advice, man. And yeah, and working. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was going to say like working smarter rather than harder is another bit of advice I got once from. Um, uh, from Al Clay, actually, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like so. So a lot of the work I do now is 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 before I actually sit down and get on with something. I I might have uh, just just thinking of stuff in your head. You know, before you start bashing away at your at your computer or whatever. And then when when you actually do sit down, you've kind of got a bit of a plan in your mind, or or like I've got like note like sometimes endless notes of like ideas for something, and oh, I should try that, or listen to this before you do that, or whatever it is, or. 
you know, that kind of stuff can help. Yeah. So, um, smarter just means be, be more prepared, like go for the right answer. Yeah. Sooner. (laughs) Yeah. Be prepared. Yeah, exactly. Be more prepared for things or, you know, yeah. Or or like, don't, don't kill yourself on something if it's, and that's something I have to, I struggle with as well as I'm definitely a perfectionist. Um, and having this kind of job where you're not, kind of not allowed to be a lot of the time because they're waiting on stuff and they're not going to, they'd rather have it 80% done than, than like perfect, but late, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I'll send stuff when I'm, when in my gut, I'm like, oh, still not ready. But like, you know, they're, they're probably not going to notice that. So, you know, you're probably better off sending it off and getting feedback early as well so that you're not yeah. wasting time. So sometimes I'll send a work in progress just so I can get feedback. Is this the right vibe? And then go all in rather than wasting a day or two on something and they're like, oh, that's not the right vibe. Sorry, you know. So that awesome. kind of stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Man. Well, Jason, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Um, let the Rockstars know how that they can find you online and learn more about you and your music. Uh, anywhere you want them to go check you out? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, I can't believe we've been chatting for two hours. It feels like no, it no goes time by so at all. Quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you want to, if you want to hear more of my music or hear more about me or get in touch, um, my website, which is jasonsuda.com, dot com, and Suda is S for sugar, O U D A H, and there's a contact page on there as well as some like press articles and and music. And then I'm on in- Instagram, which is also at Jason Suda. I like that man. S for sugar. Yes, yeah, for sugar. <laughs> Give me some sugar. Give me some yeah. sugar. Um, yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, again, thank you. Uh, just a, a, incredibly generous of you to, to give up two hours of your time like this, especially considering what we're up against as far as uh, competing for your time. And we just oh, want to thank you a great deal. No, and thank you so much. I, you know, I really enjoyed chatting with you, and you know, I, I love, I love these kind of conversations and the community of people sharing their knowledge, especially like these days on the internet and everything like that. Um, you know, thank you for having this platform for people to learn from. It's really awesome. My pleasure. A- as you suggested, two hours goes by quickly. And that's because we're talking about the thing that we're going to be talking about anyway, if we're right. just hanging out with friends all day. Right, exactly. Doing what we love. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Great to meet you. Can't wait to meet you in person. See you in the yeah, studio. Yeah, likewise. Sounds good. Thanks so much. All right, man. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, Rockstars. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things that I highly recommend you check out for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers.